Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Carolyn Ewart and I'm the National Director for Balswa Northern Ireland. We are delighted to welcome you to this, our second webinar for World Social Work Month. And I'm delighted to tell you all that we have 250 people registered for the event and joining us this morning, so or this afternoon now. So we're really, really delighted that you're all able to uh, to join in with us. Um, I want especially to thank Dr. Kira Fitzpatrick and Father Peter McBerry for taking the time to share their knowledge and experience with us. Unfortunately, due to the timings of today's Northern Ireland Executive Meeting, Minister Hargey was unable to be with us but I'm glad to say that she's recorded a message which will come to you all shortly. The title of this webinar, as many of you uh, will have guessed, is taken from the report by Professor Philip Alston, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, following his visit to the UK in 2018. The document was withering in its criticism of the UK government, highlighting that the ideology-driven austerity agenda pursued under the guise of fiscal responsibility could easily have spared the poor if the political will had existed to do so. This finding underscored his conclusion that in the UK case at least, poverty is a political choice. Poverty is a reality for many of the individuals and families that social workers support. Practitioners will be all too aware that many social problems are either rooted in or exacerbated by poverty. The prevalence of poverty is so significant that Northern Ireland's chief social worker has described it as the wallpaper of practice in the Department of Health's anti-poverty practice framework. The costs of poverty are huge, both in economic and human terms. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimates in its 2016 paper, We Can Solve Poverty in the UK, that approximately 10% of government spending, that's £78 billion, pounds, is spent annually in the UK to deal with poverty and its consequences. The impacts fall on health and social services, or education systems and criminal justice sectors. For example, research conducted by Queen's University Belfast in 2017 found that children living in the most deprived areas in Northern Ireland are six times more likely to be placed on the Child Protection Register and are four times more likely to become looked after by social services than in the least deprived areas. And I mean, those are really stark figures. Um, and we know that the financial cost of looking after children and young people is vast. Figures provided by the Northern Ireland Office of Social Services indicate that the annual cost per placement of keeping a child in residential care ranges from £164,000 to £299,000 per year, depending on the type of residential facility. And the average yearly cost for a foster care placement is a fraction of that at, at £28,000. However, these figures say nothing of the human cost to the children and families affected. According to Social Justice Ireland, there are currently 637,000 people living in poverty in Ireland, of which approximately 194,000 are children. The most recent Department for Community Statistics, published in May 2020, or for the period April 18 to March 19. And at that time, around 350,000 people in Northern Ireland lived in relative income poverty. And that figure included approximately 107,000 children. COVID-19 has undoubtedly extended the reach of poverty on both sides of the border, across the UK and across the globe. But the problems that we have seen were present before the pandemic and they will continue to exist unless our economic recovery plans and longer term government anti-poverty and economic development strategies commit to address both the causes and impacts of poverty. Today's webinar is an opportunity to explore the challenges we face across this island. The first speaker that I will introduce to you is Deidre Hargey the Minister for Communities. And Steph, if you could play her video now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to address you all today. And I'm sorry that I'm unable to participate in person, 
I'm delighted, however, to take the opportunity to tell you about the work which my department is leading on to reduce poverty and support the most vulnerable within our society. In my role as Minister for Communities, one of my key priorities is to help address economic inequality and minimise the impacts of poverty and deprivation on people's lives. In that respect, we share a common goal. I'm committed to seeing the reduction in poverty and to support the most vulnerable within our society. There has never been a more important time for this work to be taken forward. COVID-19 has impacted on all of our lives with growing levels of poverty and inequality impacting on the physical and mental health and well-being of individuals, families and communities. Last March, I stood up the Emergencies Leadership Group to ensure a collective response was provided to those in need. And since then, everything that we have done in response to this pandemic has been shaped by that partnership with regional and grassroots leaders involved. To date, my department has provided almost £304 million in funding to support individuals, communities and sectors which have been negatively impacted by this unprecedented pandemic. I put in place a range of measures to mitigate, mitigate the social security, economic and wellbeing efforts of the COVID-19, including standing up a data COVID-19 community helpline, ensuring access to food, medicines, delivering a range of emergency and safeguard, the contingency of benefits and additional financial support to those facing hardship. I worked in partnership across central and local government, our arm's length bodies, to provide financial and practical support across a range of sectors from sports, arts, culture, charity and community sectors. My officials collaborated with other departments to deliver joined up response and work with local councils to address the impact of the pandemic on our towns and cities, as well as the financial impacts of COVID-19 had on council income. We provided temporary accommodation for over 3,000 households, including those individuals and families with no recourse to public funds. Housing is an area that is also very close to my heart and I'm committed to delivering housing and housing services for people in line with the measures announced by former Minister Carl Nicollin last year. Our future homeless policy will build on the lessons learned from how we dealt with the COVID-19 crisis as we work to improve our response to homelessness. There is no doubt the draft budget settlement presents many challenges for the executive, but I want to assure you that I'm doing everything in my power to maintain the critical services and support for those most in need. For example, our Supporting People programme, which funds temporary accommodation and community-based support and advice for families that are homeless, or at risk of becoming homeless has been protected in the annual budget for £72.8 million. Pounds. In relation to Social Security, I continue to lobby for changes which would positively benefit people here and those most in need, such as retaining the £20 uplift in universal and tax credit, which has gone some way in helping those who are struggling financially. I have also listened to the concerns of the independent advice sector and I've given my commitment to the continuation of funding for this critical service. While we still need to respond to the immediate needs of vulnerable people, we also look to the future. I am committed to working with the executive and my colleagues to find sustainable ways of addressing poverty and inequality across our communities. This is why my department is leading on the development of social strategies on behalf of the executive which help address the inequalities and barriers that people face every day. There, they are the anti-poverty strategy, the disability strategy, gender equality strategy, and sexual orientation, LGBTQI strategies. My officials are developing strategies in partnership with expert panels, co-design groups, representing the voluntary and community sector, and cross-departmental groups and officials within the civil service. These strategies will ensure that they are delivered in a joined up way and impact people right across our society. The Executive has also approved the extension of the existing 2016-19 Child Poverty Strategy to May 2022. This is to allow time for engagement on how best to address child poverty as we move forward with the anti-poverty strategy. My officials will also consider the findings of the ongoing review of our Neighbourhood Renewal Programme 
which has seen approximately £18 million invested annually, targeting some 65 urban areas of deprivation across the north and approximately one in six of the population. As we take forward my department's new five-year strategy, Building Inclusive Communities, I'm committed to developing better ways of engaging communities and I invite you all to consider how we can work together to deliver our common purpose of supporting people, building communities and shaping places as you too develop your delivery plans for the future. Finally, I want to thank your organisation for the work that you are doing to address poverty, support vulnerable individuals and families, and I look forward to working with you in the future. And lots there. Thank you, Minister uh, Hargy. I, I think there's lots there that we can um, that we'll take forward, and, and hopefully we'll have some questions uh, in in our uh, in our question and answer session. Um, I think certainly, you know, the the anti poverty strategy. We, we look forward to seeing um, how that shapes out. Um, I know I know there's no funding available uh, to support that, and I think that will. Um, that will present real challenges, uh, but I'm delighted to see that the, the child poverty strategy has been extended to 2022. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll pick up on on those issues later. Um, and now for our next speaker, uh, I want to introduce to you Dr. Kira Fitzpatrick, fresh from the Good Morning Ulster uh, radio this morning. Um, Kira is a, a lecturer and researcher at the School of Law and the Transitional Justice Institute. Uh, she's a founding member of the Cliff Edge Coalition and a very active member of the Equality Coalition. And Kira, we've worked with you. Uh, uh, we've been delighted to work with you for many years on on both those projects. Uh, but thank you, and Kira, over to you. Thanks so much, Carolyn, for the kind introduction, and um, I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, and to speak with so many social workers who are really working at the front line of poverty and are seeing it every single day. And I'm sure um, that they are seeing it um, get worse, that they're seeing the spiral of poverty um, continue to really sweep more people into its reach and into its clutches. And unfortunately, I think the outlook um, is bleak um, unless there is, as you indicated, Carolyn, some real investment in structural anti-poverty measures. And unfortunately, the UK budget did not deliver that yesterday. And the current community's budget leaves much to be desired, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I'm gonna start by just setting the scene um, about you know, what's really going on in Northern Ireland at the minute in terms of poverty. Um, I think a general comment would be that poverty was already very prevalent before the pandemic hit, as indicated by those statistics that were published in 2018-2019. So March 2019, we heard that there was 350,000 people in poverty. Well, in terms of child poverty, we saw a 5% increase from the previous year. So poverty went up from 19% to 24%, and that's children in relative poverty. So that's a significant increase within a year. And of course, we can point to, we, we perhaps can't make a direct link because of lack of evidence, but we can definitely point to the austerity measures that have been implemented over the last 10 years, particularly the introduction of the two child limit um, that Baswa has been um, campaigning very hard on, um, as well as the benefit cap, which are, is impacting uh, lone parents and families predominantly. So the situation um, has definitely been compounded and exacerbated by the current pandemic. We now have about 142,000 um, households on universal credit. That was um, the, the Department for Communities highlighted that in January 2021. So I'm sure that has even increased since then. Um, and to give you an idea of the income shock for households that are going on to universal credit, um, I'll reference research from the Resolution Foundation, which suggests that those people who are on the job retention scheme that are furloughed at the moment, they're facing about a 9% hit on their disposable income. So I suppose it's definitely still a hit, 
but perhaps more manageable than those who have found themselves unemployed due to the pandemic and um, turning towards universal credit. Um, and they are facing up to a 50% hit on their disposable income. So you can imagine the, you know, the impact that that's going to have on families' abilities to meet everyday costs, to meet their rent costs, their mortgage costs, utility costs, all of that. Um, and this has been further exacerbated by the lockdown conditions where we're seeing children at home who require to be homeschooled, um, the heat's on longer, there's more food required, there's more heat required, um, and that all takes more money. And universal credit simply does not meet the costs of living and the costs of modern life. Um, we know that uh, it you know, we know that there's very low replacement rates in the British, in the UK social security system compared to other OCD country, OECD countries. And the reason behind that is because the labour market is expected to be very fast and that people are, are expected to move back into employment very quickly. But of course, that's not the case. We're in unprecedented times. Um, and, you know, it's going to be much, much harder to find work in this depressed economy and people are going to be on universal credit much longer than um, perhaps the government expects them to be. And it's quite worrying that rather than kind of bolster the current broken safety net, the um, government is investing billions of pounds in employment support when, you know, the evidence suggests that the employment just isn't there. Um, in terms of uh, the kind of response, the pandemic response here in Northern Ireland, uh, my view is that it has been quite patchy. Um, we have had 20 million, nearly 20 million of expenditure on food aid, for example. Um, that has been difficult for a lot of families to access, depending on what area they live in, because it has been filtered through charitable organisations and third sector organisations. And of course, the stigma that comes along with actually, you know, going along to a food bank and asking for help is very difficult. And of course, it would always be the preference that people get money directly into the household, cash directly into the household, so they can spend it on what they need to spend it on. So I would say generally, there's been a very reactive approach rather than a proactive approach. Um, there's been really kind of temporary measures put in place rather than looking at some of the structural issues. So for example, um, we, we've seen that families and children have been really severely impacted by the pandemic. Um, and there has been very, very little in the way of support um, for children and families from the social security system and in terms of the government's emergency response. In Northern Ireland here, it's obviously been very positive that free school meal provision, for example, has been paid directly into those people who are eligible as bank accounts um, and, and we definitely stand out from the rest of the UK in that respect. I'm sure you've all seen the terrible pictures on social media of some of the food parcels that have been delivered in other parts of the UK um, and, and you know are clearly inadequate to meet a child or a family's nutritional means and you know are really a slight on their dignity. Um, one problem that I've particularly encountered um, during lockdown as, you know, I'm a, a local volunteer for a charity in my area is actually being able to access emergency support. Um, and I'm sure social workers will have, you know, come into contact this as with, with this as well. So you have people moving into flats for the first time, maybe homeless have been homeless for a while, they're moving into their accommodation for the first time, um, or there's been a family separation and there's been domestic violence and they're moving into new accommodation or indeed care leavers that are moving in to their own home for the first time. And where it was, you know, a wee bit easier to get support through the social fund, the system of discretionary support here in Northern Ireland, very difficult to access. Um, I know myself um, that we have, you know, found a lot of requests from local social work agencies 
and health trusts for support with white goods, furniture, um, you know, those big ticket items that people need to make a house a home. Um, and, you know, that's that's really difficult when that's been passed on to the community and voluntary sector rather than people being able to get that help directly from the state. And a big reason for that is because people um, are now going on to universal credit and they have the five week wait. And so therefore they're having to take an advance payment and that advance payment contributes to the debt um, the debt that they have in terms of their social security debt and that means that they find it much harder to get support from um, to get a budgeting loan or discretionary support loan or a discretionary support grant. I'm going to look just briefly at the future now um, and as I say I think it looks particularly bleak and particularly in view of the Department for Communities budget and you know the Minister did indicate that it's a very difficult budget and um, you know really it's a flat rate budget it doesn't take into consideration all of the additional costs that the pandemic has really you know implicated here and um, so we you know an example is that we've got no money for the youth employment scheme that is running over in the UK the job start scheme so um 18 to 24 year olds are really going to struggle to get back into the workplace and they are one of the main groups of people who have um lost employment during the pandemic um a, a huge blow for those advocates of strength and mitigations in Northern Ireland is that there isn't the budget there to implement mitigation against the two child limit. It's something that the minister really hoped to do and there was positive noises about it but unfortunately the 28 million that they need can't be found at the minute. They are going to um, really just extend the existing package. They're going to close a couple of loopholes that currently exist in, in respect of the benefit cap and the bedroom tax. But, you know, really so many challenges that um, have come down the road with the rollout of universal credit aren't going to be addressed, including that five week wait. And indeed, such are the current staff shortages um, that they um, reckon that people could be waiting up to six or seven weeks if there's another burst in claims at the end of the job retention scheme because there's no money in the budget to hire the additional 900 staff that the Department for Communities need to be able to process claims. Um, and there is a reduction in uh, help for homelessness services as well. So it really is, um, as one of the members of the Communities Committee um, described it as it's a doomsday budget. I know that um, a lot of us um, in the Cliff Edge Coalition and other organisations have responded to the consultation on the budget um, and we can only hope that um, you know there is a positive response from the Department of Finance and from the Minister for Communities and that they do find the resources to make sure that those people in the most need can access the support that they so desperately need at the moment. And just a quick word about yesterday's budget, I've already kind of referenced it anyway, but obviously the 20 pound uplift to universal credit has been extended and that is really important, but it is time limited for six months. You know, that is built into the budget. So the expectation is that that will end in September. And um, so people are going to, you know, get a, 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 another income shock at that point when the economy is still very much depressed um, and there's go it's going to be very very difficult for people to get out and find new employment so you know that is really disappointing and really worrying and as I say they also didn't really announce any measures yesterday in terms of closing that inequality gap they haven't looked at how they're going to deal with the 6.5% unemployment rate. They haven't looked at how they're going to increase support for those young people who are unemployed. And most importantly, they haven't identified how they're going to tackle the huge increase in child, child poverty. And this is really going to affect generations to come. Um, and children at this time are really suffering. Uh, we have done some research um, around 
with in partnership with Universal Credit Claimants in um, Northern Ireland, we work with a group called UC Us, um, and the mental health impact of uh, being on Universal Credit is something that they really highlighted. It's the spiral of never-ending debt that they get themselves into because of the advance payment, or I, I should say that's you know enforced upon them because of the advance payment and um, because of um, various loans and maybe historic benefit payments that they're having to try and claw or that they're trying to claw back um, and as well as that it's just the mental pressure of trying to hide this hide these feelings from their children and from their families and trying to shield and the worst impacts of this financial stress that they're going through um, from their children um, and also trying to make sure that they have access to um, all the things that they need food clothes educational tools you know extracurricular activities treats of birthdays all those little things put such a huge strain on people who are currently claiming universal credit so I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'm afraid that I don't have a positive message to end on. Rather, um, what I would like to ask you know, all of us to do is to talk about this, to talk openly about this. It's not talked about enough in the media or with politicians. Poverty is a huge problem here. Um, and we need to constantly bring attention to it and I suppose constantly hold our elected representatives to account and ask what they are doing and what they plan to do to really make sure that they take a structural and sustainable and successful response to poverty. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kira. I mean, it is really incredible and I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, it, in light of the fact that you're saying, you know, that the future is bleak, I mean, it, it doesn't look good. What what can we do, do you think, to try and influence change? I mean, you kind of captured some of that at the end, that we, we need to campaign. But what what would you say to those of us who are, who are listening and want to get involved, who want to be active in, in, in this field? What can we do? I would say, you know, if, if you come across something in your practice that is really bothering you, and if it's a direct, you know, if it's the direct impact of poverty, if you are seeing that every day, I would encourage you to get in contact with your local MLA, with your local councillor and say, look, this is a real problem in our community at the minute um, and we need to see action on this. I think the more voices that elective representatives hear and the more forceful that our message can be um, at the moment and through engagement with local representatives, I do think that they don't fully understand the extent of the problem because they aren't seeing it every day. They're not working with, yeah. you know, they, you know, they're not really experiencing or listening to people who have experienced poverty firsthand. And I think that it's our responsibility to make sure that they understand um, just how severe the struggles that people are going through at the minute are. That's great, Kira, and, and lots for us to think on there in terms of uh, planning for, you know, how we, I mean, you say we, we have done a lot of campaigning and, and how we, we plan to, to take this forward. So we'll, we'll think on that and we'll, we'll, we'll come up with uh, some plans. But thank you very much indeed. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Father Peter McVerry, um, who has been active in social justice for, for many years. He uh, opened his first hostel for the homeless in 1979, and the, the newly named uh, Peter McVeary Trust now has 25 hostels, four drug treatment centres, and 500 apartments across Ireland. Um, he's an active writer and thinker, and we are delighted to have him with us today, sharing his thoughts on this most important of issues. <laughs> We unfortunately don't have Father Peter uh, able to, to join us uh, on screen, but he is uh, live with us on the phone. And so, Father Peter, I'm going to, to hand over to you now, OK? Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for having me. I want, to talk about, uh, I want to talk about uh, not just income poverty, but the quality of life of people depends largely on access to basic services. 
And so I want to talk about the inability of people to access basic services such as housing and, and health. And I begin with housing and homelessness because that's the area I'm most involved in. It's an enormous contributor to poverty down here in the Republic of Ireland, probably the most significant uh, contributor. It brought down the last government uh, and this government is well aware that unless they address the housing crisis, uh, they will not be in power after the next election. So it is a very, very live issue here in the Republic of Ireland. In a housing structure, there are three parts to it. There's private housing, there's council housing, and there's private rented. And now we have a perfect storm. All three of those parts are in crisis at exactly the same time. In terms of private housing, all the experts here estimate that we need to build 35,000 extra houses every year just to keep up with the demographic increase. Nothing to do with housing waiting lists or homelessness, just to keep up with the demographic uh, 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 expansion. And all we're building is in the region of 20,000 a year. So the, the number of the demand for private housing is is increasing and it's chasing a limited supply of housing and of course house prices therefore are going up <clears throat> now if you want to buy the average house in dublin and get a mortgage you need an income of 100,000 euros you won't get a mortgage unless you have that sort of income and even to buy a house in the rest of the country you still need an income of 70,000 euros to get a mortgage so private housing is increasingly out of reach of the majority of Irish people and of almost all young people, unless they have very wealthy parents. So people who need, want private housing, where are they going to get housed? They're going into the private rented sector. Then you have, a, then you have council housing. You know, in 1975, this country built 8,500 council houses. And in 1985, and we had a recession in the 80s, we still built 6,900 council houses. And in 2015, this country built 75 council houses. And that's a huge problem. It was a deliberate privatization uh, attempt to privatize social housing. So there's a huge uh, shortage of council housing uh, for people with very, very long waiting lists. And so people who can't get into council housing, where are they going? Into the private rented sector. And the private rented sector can't cope with this demand. And so rents have gone through the roof. The average rent now in Dublin is in the region of 2,000 euros per month far beyond what most people can can afford so we have a huge number of homeless people we have in the re est we have uh, uh, registered in the region of eight to ten thousand homeless people but that doesn't include many it doesn't include people who are sleeping rough are sleeping in cars or tents doesn't include women and children in domestic refuges it doesn't include immigrants who are living in the uh, in direct provision centres, but who have been given permission to stay in Ireland, but they can't move out because they can't get accommodation. It doesn't include probably a couple of thousand people who are sofa surfing. And it doesn't include tens of thousands of people, young adults in their 20s, 30s and 40s, still living with their parents because they can't afford to move out. So we have a massive, massive homeless problem. People who are unable to have their own home and all the consequences that follow from that in terms of having a family and, and having children. And there's a perception of homelessness. The perception is if you're homeless, there must be something wrong with you. You must have an addiction problem or maybe you have a mental health problem or maybe you have a behavior problem. Nobody wants you. But that's totally untrue today. There is a small minority of homeless people who have an addiction or a mental health problem. But the vast majority of homeless people today have only got one problem. They don't have enough money to be able to get their own accommodation. Homeless people today are people whose income is too low to be able to get a mortgage. It's too high to be able to get council housing. And they're stuck in private rent which they can no longer afford. 
this is a deliberate policy to push people into the private rented sector. It's quite deliberate in our housing policy and in our housing strategy. And the government have gone to great lengths to try and highlight the advantages of the private rented sector. But there are huge disadvantages in pushing people into the private rented sector. Some of the people who find it very difficult are travelers. Uh, there is huge racial bias against travelers down here and many, many landlords will not rent to travelers. Immigrants, those who have been given, been given permission to stay in Ireland, again, huge bias against immigrants. Many tr landlords will not rent to, to travelers. Young single people, people out of care. Landlords will not, uh, frequently will not rent to uh, young single people. They fear they're gonna have parties in the house or they fear that maybe uh, they're gonna wreck the place. And people with disabilities, people who maybe need ad adaptations to their accommodation uh, are not going to be able to enter into the private rented sector. So there's a huge number of people who are excluded, excluded from, from housing and uh, are living in, in dire circumstances. Not only have we got a huge homeless problem, but we have, to, we have a huge number of people who are living in overcrowded homes because they don't want to register as homeless, because of the stigma that's attached to, to being homeless. Uh, there are a lot of people living in poor quality private rented accommodation. And I've seen some of that accommodation. And some of that accommodation is absolutely horrific. But they can't complain. Because if they complain about the poor quality, the landlord will throw them out and they'll end up homeless. Again, there are a lot of people in good quality accommodation, but they're paying 50, 60, and in some cases, 75% of their income to the landlord to, to keep a roof over their head. And they, are, they might have a good income, but they're in poverty because they cannot afford to feed themselves properly, to heat their home properly, or to buy the other necessities that they need. And there are people in mortgage arrears of more than two years who are afraid to open the post in case it's a letter from the bank saying they're going to repossess the house. So in my estimate, there are in the Republic of Ireland about 750,000 to a million people whose housing situation is causing them enormous distress. So it's, a, it's, it's probably the biggest contributor to a to poor quality of life in, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, there, as I say, we need, the solutions are, are very obvious. We, they've been talked about for many, we need to build council housing, but there's a huge reluctance to build council housing. The privatization agenda is very much on the, uh, the, the top of conservative government's uh, agendas. And the other factor is the commodification of housing. Many of the houses that are being built now are not available to, uh, to, to purchase because they're being bought up even before they're completed. They're being bought up by the big international investment funds and they will be rented out to people, of course, at the top end of the rental market, but they're not available for first time buyers to, uh, to purchase. That commodification of housing, again, has been deliberate government policy. They have attracted in the big international investment funds by huge tax uh, concessions. Most of those funds don't pay any tax. They don't pay tax on the income from the rental. They don't pay capital gains tax. They don't pay any tax at all. And that's government policy. So our problems are, uh, are, are government induced. The other big issue down here, of course, is access to health. And again, this is a privatization. Our government want to privatize as much of the healthcare as possible, get as many people onto private health insurance as possible. And how do you do that? The only way you do that is by making public health very poor, providing a very poor public health system. As one government minister, in fact, it was a labor government minister said, how could you, encourage people into the private rent private health sector 
if you had a very good public health service. So we have at the moment one million people in a population of five million, one million people waiting to see a consultant. Two, uh, I've had two hips replaced. First hip was about 15, 16 years ago, and uh, I got it done on private health insurance. And so uh, my doctor sent the letter off to the consultant. Consultant called me in a week later, said, you need your hip replaced. I said, I know. And he said, well, how about next Tuesday? About five or six years ago, I got the second hip replaced. I did it on the public health system. I was waiting about a year to see the consultant. And when I did see the consultant, he told me, put you on a waiting list. You'll probably be done December of next year. Now, it didn't bother me because it wasn't, but some people would be in enormous pain from a, from a hip uh, needing replacement. And to have to wait maybe two years to get that hip done is causing enormous uh, uh, problems for, for people who cannot afford private health insurance. They may have children who are in pain. They may have elderly parents in pain. Uh, and they're on a waiting list for a for 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 an for an operation, and of course the pandemic has pushed the waiting list much higher than it was before the pandemic, because a lot of operations have been uh, and a, a lot of assessments uh, have been have been postponed. The other thing I'd like to mention is the working poor. We have over a hundred thousand people working full time either on the minimum wage or on low hours contracts. And they're in poverty. They're working full time, but they're not getting a wage that would enable them to live a proper life. Our minimum wage is several euros per hour below the living wage. And that working poor, uh, are, are, there's nothing they can do about it. They can't get a job that would pay them any more. And final thing I'd like to mention is rural poverty. Rural poverty is something we often overlook. But one of the greatest poverties is loneliness. And in rural Ireland, loneliness is a huge problem. We have closed many of the services in the smaller towns and villages in Ireland. We closed the police stations. We've often closed the post offices. Now the banks are pulling out. Ulster Bank is pulling out of uh, the Republic of Ireland and Bank of Ireland have announced 88 branch closures. And many of the pubs have closed because they're no longer viable. There's a dwindling population because there's no jobs in the rural areas and there's a lack of rural transport to bring people to or from the pubs. So the heart of rural Ireland is being, is being taken out is and leaving people very very vulnerable, leaving people in 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 real in real lo, uh, lo, loneliness. So we have a massive problem here in the Republic of Ireland, uh, <clears throat> and the problems stem from government policy. As I say, the housing problem we have stems from a government commitment to the neoliberal pro, uh, neoliberal. Uh, a policy of trying to privatize everything. Similarly with the health service, similarly with rural loneliness. You know, the closure of police stations, post offices, banks, they all to do with, uh, with financial, in improving the financial uh, uh, situation of, of the government or of the, or, or of the banks. So to do a policy, uh, and that policy uh, has to change. So I'm going to leave it there, uh, but very happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Uh, Father Peter, I mean, thank you for that. And you know, we we can all um, we can all relate. I mean, a million people in 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 distress because of uh, a poor quality of life because of housing. Um, your your points about access to healthcare. Uh, and waiting lists, I mean, are, are huge issues. Um, I, I'll not get into the waiting lists and how, how big they are here, but we're, we're, we're looking pre-pandemic at, you know, two, three years. Um, so, yeah, there, there's lots to, to try and, uh, and cover. Uh, but thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to hand over now to, to Martina Jordan, who, who will take us through some of the questions that are, that are coming through.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Carolyn, thank you, Martina. Okay, um, well, just from a social worker, I'd like to thank Kira and Peter, Father Peter, so much for what is has been a really emotionally compelling um, presentation by both of you. I mean, it's just the, the human impact impacts of what you've both said, um, you know, it's, um, it's quite shocking. And I actually um, have had uh, emails through to me um, from social workers who are really concerned that what you've both said has huge implications for social works across the board from cradle to grave, from cradle to grave. So again, that's something that we as an organisation, um, Carolyn, will, will have to look at. Um, most of, both you, Kira and Peter, have, have actually uh, already addressed most of the questions that are coming in, but there's a couple of comments um, I would like to share with you, Kira. Uh, it's in relation to, sorry, in relation to, uh, it was one made by a, a student social worker. Um, I'm a second year student social work, social work student uh, on Universal Credit with two children and can totally relate to everything you spoke about, Kira. I had to give up my work to study and care for my children, the toughest thing I've ever done with very little help. It's almost like I am punished by the government for wanting a better life for my family. Would you like to respond to that? Just to say that, you know, those experiences of people who are um, currently on universal credit are so important. And, you know, I would encourage uh, people to talk more openly about it. Um, you might have heard on the radio this morning, uh, one of the contributors was a lady on universal credit and she said, you know, she didn't share her name because she felt so stigmatised um, claiming benefits, um, even though, you know, she she needs them. It's, it's there, you're entitled to it, it's your right to claim these benefits. But over the last 30 years, as, as Father Peter very well, or very articulated really well, um, the neoliberal system has made people feel like they're undeserving of this support um, and that they're being lazy or scroungers or, you know, when you hear all these horrible words and you see all this hor horrible poverty porn about people living on benefits, um, and that's just not the reality of people's lives. Um, so I just want to send lots of solidarity to that mum and to wish her all the best in her studies. And, you know, I really hope that she um, can look back on this experience and um, think about why it was so important that she did um, take the leap and um, you know try and make a better life, life for her children. Yeah, thank you, Kira. And again, could I come in on that myself? You could can I come in for a moment? Please do. Yeah, I, I think what's the way forward? I think the way forward is we need a groundswell. Of, uh, of of opinion that pushes government to make changes. And that groundswell has got to include middle class people. It can't just be the uh, the people at the bottom. And I think the way to uh, to get middle class people on board is, as Kira says, you tell stories. You can give statistics till the cows come home, uh, but it doesn't move people. It's the stories that move people, the stories of people struggling, the stories of people who are in difficulty. That's what moves people. I think we need, as Kira said, to get those stories out there uh, and to try and get that swell of public opinion that demands change. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, we know that there are negative public narratives. Um, often fueled by media coverage concerning people who are homeless or dependent on, on uh, social security. Um, and as you said, get it's not just the people who are suffering, it's those who can support them, have the means and capacity to support those people to have their voices raised. Um, th there's a question come in, uh, Father Peter, uh, about um, the homeless, well, you've already alluded to it throughout your presentation about the homeless crisis being very worrying uh, and that so much of the problem, in fact, from what I heard, most of the problem uh, can be traced back to poor decisions by successive governments in relation to social housing provision. Um, what could be done immediately? Can anything be done immediately apart from lobbying and supporting um, sort of homeless people uh, to address more pressing needs, their, their more, most pressing needs? Um, on both well, sides of the border? 
Yeah, well, well, there's no magic wand, but the first thing we have to do, if the problem of homelessness is because of a uh, lack of social uh, council housing, there's no solution to homelessness unless we start building council housing on a massive scale, as we did back in the uh, the 70s and the 80s. And that's the first priority I would have for government. We gotta go back to providing social housing. Local authorities don't wanna do it. They don't want the pro problem of managing social housing estates. Uh, if the low social housing estates cause problems, there are many social housing estates in Ireland cause no problems at all. People are very happy living there and they're causing no problems whatever to anybody. We've got to go back to building social housing. To put pressure on government, we are demanding a referendum on the right to housing in the constitution. If we could get that right to housing in the constitution, we have the right to education in the constitution. And as a result of that, every single child in this country is entitled to an education. And if they're not getting it, they can go to the courts and the courts will demand that the government uh, provide that child with an education. If we could get the right to housing into the constitution, that would put, doesn't mean everybody the next day can look for the keys of a house, of course not, but it puts pressure on government to provide policies and a timeline by which everybody can have their right uh, to a home uh, guaranteed to them. We need to implement the Kenny report. That's probably uh, uh, not very familiar to many of your, uh, many of the listeners. The Kenny report uh, wanted to, uh, wanted to control the price of building land. Land is, is, is sometimes 30% or 40% of the cost of the building of a house. And there's a lot of land hoarding going on down here because land is increasing at uh, 10, 15% a year. So if a developer holds on to the land for a few years, he can make more money. So the Kenny report uh, uh, wanted to uh, control the price of, of building land and that could be done. And it doesn't cost any money. In fact, it would save money <laughs> to control the cost of, of building land. Uh, so there are things that can be done, there are things that can be done immediately and that will make a difference, not necessarily this year or next year, but will make a huge difference in the medium term. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, just uh, we have our counterpart, my counterpart, Lena Murphy from IASWA uh, in the South. So the Inter um, Irish Association of Social Workers just endorsing everything Kira, you and Father Peter have said. Um, and thanking you for, for what, what you've presented with, to us today. Um, another comment we have, Kira, for you, um, it's from a, a delegate in Scotland who's very worried, obviously, like ourselves, about the future of children and families. Um, and he or she uh, is concerned, very concerned about how things are going to be post-pandemic. Um, would a fair taxation approach, would that help people out of poverty? What do you think, Kira? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I I heard a statistic yesterday that if we um, put the tax of uh, the UK's millionaires up by just one percent, we could uh, earn in the region, or the government could recoup in the region of two hundred and fifty billion pounds, and that's just a one percent tax raise on the very rich and you know I do think that uh, this has been a key kind of outcome of the pandemic is that it has really exposed just how unequal our society is and you know we have seen rich corporations get even richer um, and it is those people who are working in, on, in minimum wage jobs or those people who've been un, unemployed, made unemployed, that are really carrying the burden of the economic impact of this pandemic on their shoulders. And it's completely unfair and unjust. So absolutely, um, you know, we need a fair taxation policy. Unfortunately, with the current government in power, um, you know, I don't think that's going to come down the line. They're increasing corporation tax um, to 25%, but not until 2023. Um, and indeed, those businesses that earn under 250,000 will be impacted. So we don't really know, you know, what the outcome of that is going to be. But the big worry is that rather than recoup the money or to try and find 
additional public spending from the rich, that it's going to be, again, those people in poverty that are going to be punished um, with another austerity program. And that would just be, it would just be awful, totally mm -hmm. awful. Okay, thank you, Kira. Uh, Father Peter, is there anything you'd like to say about that? There's a lot I'd like to say about that. <laughs> you know, Ireland has nine, the Republic of Ireland has nine billionaires. And during last year, during the pandemic, they saw their total wealth increase by 3.84 billion euros. The huge, and some of that money is pushed off into offshore accounts, some of it uh, legally, some of it illegally. But yeah, the, you know, if we want to understand poverty, we have to analyze wealth. You can't understand poverty without un analyzing where is all the money. And as uh, as Kira said, if we uh, if we were to fairly tax those who could afford to be taxed, uh, we would have no poverty in this country. We would have no poverty in the world if those who are wealthy paid uh, a fair share share of tax. It is. It, it just highlights the inequality that exists in our society and the inequality that has been uh, has been exaggerated by the uh, the pandemic. Oh, millions of people have suffered loss of jobs, loss of income, been pushed into dire poverty, while the world's billionaires uh, have have increased their wealth at an enormous rate during the the pandemic. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Father Peter. Carolyn, I'm going to hand back to you because there are so many questions and comments coming in um, that we probably won't be able to, to well, we'll not be able to take. So if you maybe want to take over, we could maybe get back to this kind of um, issue at a, at a later stage, at another time. There's a huge interest in this, obviously. Yeah, and, and I think that, Martina, thank you so much for uh, for sharing that, that part of the discussion. I mean, I think we can see from the comments that are coming through, um, there's just massive interest. I mean, we've lots of people uh, reporting uh, through their own experiences um, of uh, of poverty, of, of health inequalities, expressing solidarity uh, with everything that people are saying. So, I mean, it really is a, a live issue, and I think it's one that uh, that we will that we will come back to. Um, we'll, we'll take it, I think, offline and, and consider how how best we can try and capture those experiences from people uh, to to share um, and, and take on board. Uh, I think some of your points, Kira and, and Father Peter, about how how we try and coordinate um, and bring bring those voices to to the fore. Um, so yeah, that's a piece of work for for us to do. Um, I want to say uh, just a, a thank you to uh, to Kira and to Peter. I mean, you're you're uh, you have been an inspiration. It, it's fair to say uh, to me, to Martina, uh, and to to many of the the people listening. I've no doubt, um, and um, it uh, it's been it's been an, a, a really a very emotional and. Um, uh, experience. So, uh, without really further ado, I'm going to say thank you, Kira. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'll ask for any last comments, uh, and then I'll I'll close down. Kira, last word. Just to say that you know this is uh, one of three or three or four talks that I've done this week, and I think we all share the same feelings of anger and dissatisfaction at the current situation and just to agree with Father Peter to say it would be so great if you know we've 142,000 households now yeah. claiming universal credit now in the benefit system if we could you know mobilize those people to not be ashamed to talk about their experience and talk about you know the quality how their quality of life has been so compromised by the current social security system and by the current housing situation and to really really push for change and i honestly think that the pandemic has brought more public support to really tackling poverty. And we need the same spirit that was there in the 1950s and 60s when there was a real drive against poverty and a collective action to push for change. And, you know, I, 
I think that we can all be part of that and you know I am really excited to see what we can all do when we work together. Thank you Kira. a call to arms. Father Peter, any last thoughts from yourself? Yeah, I think we need to uh, we need to emphasize that poverty and living in poverty with its consequences is not inevitable. We have normalized poverty. People think, well, poverty is part just of a, a developing society, that some people just get left behind, not much we can do about it. Uh, we need to get rid of that narrative, and we need to ensure that poverty is understood as a failure of government policy, and that government policy can eradicate poverty uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we put our mind to, to, to addressing it. You know, normalizing homelessness. We've normalized homelessness down here. Uh, I remember a few years ago, about six, seven years ago, I gave a talk uh, and I was predicting a tsunami of homelessness. And the figure I mentioned was 5,000 people homeless. Now we have over, we have, now we have about 10,000 people homeless. And of course, it's been normalized. Uh, people are not shocked anymore. People were shocked when I used the figure 5,000, said, ridiculous, where did you get that from? You're, you're, you're way off. Uh, people are not shocked anymore. They're not shocked by poverty. They're not shocked by homelessness. And we've got to shock them. And the way to shock them, as Kira said, tell the stories of people who are, uh, uh, who are suffering from poverty. Thank you, Father Peter. So we will, we hear the call to arms and we will, we'll take it up on your behalf. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Thank you.